The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, and it is my great pleasure to bring you, after much delay, at last the final movement of Berlioz's epic symphony fantastique. The title, Songe d'une nuit du sabbat, literally means dream of a Sabbath night, though in this case, what's meant is, of course, not just any old Sabbath, but a so-called Black Sabbath. Before we dive into the music, just to observe that this very superstitious notion of a witch's Sabbath had survived the Age of Reason all the way into the Romantic era. Not that most educated city-dwelling sophisticates like Berlioz actually believed that such a thing had ever really existed, but a lot of rural folk probably still did, and it was a juicy enough dramatic premise as to be reused in Mussorgsky's Night on the Bald Mountain. I'd say that Mussorgsky's piece is different enough from Berlioz's Songe d'une nuit to easily justify its existence, and is really strikingly original, though it certainly has Berlioz in its DNA. It's rather funny that a lot of casual concert music listeners are quite familiar with the Mussorgsky, probably because of Walt Disney's Fantasia more than anything else but much less aware of this movement, if they've even heard Symphony Fantastique or paid much attention to its dramatic premises. In the case of the brash young Berlioz, the shock value of portraying a black mass on stage would probably be the equivalent of a heavy metal act doing the same thing starting in the 1970s, though by now a lot of it seems like a cliché, sort of endlessly recycling the same sense of danger to annoy your parents and scare the local fuddy-duddies. But think back to the impact of this piece on a still very conservatively pious country like France, recovering from the massive societal hiccup of the revolution a generation and a half before. In the first movement, Berlioz admits that he's obsessed, and writes a whole sonata allegro about it. Then he throws in a sublimely catchy waltz in place of a scherzo, and then a moving, endearing pastoral, all with a lot of music pictorialism along the way. Then he kills himself at the end of a march to the guillotine, and now he sends himself to hell. It all reads like a very daring, mildly trashy, but ultimately triumphant novel of that time, except as an overwhelmingly original work of music. It occurred to me the other day that Berlioz had made attempts at writing opera as a very young composer, all of which led nowhere. Opera was the equivalent artistic phenomenon of cinema today both with their blockbusters, average runs, low-budget projects, and total failures. What could a breakout composer with absolutely no reputation or credibility do to create a dramatic work when they didn't have the budget to hire an opera house and mount a production with superstar singers, lavish sets and costumes, and an army of technical people behind the scenes? The answer for Berlioz was to put all of that action in the minds of his audience, to make his music even more personal and individual to the imagination of each listener. Then he wouldn't need an opera house, just an orchestra, plus some special cameos by instruments that were unusual visitors back in the 1830s, like English horn, serpent, harps, bells, and so on. I'd argue that the Symphony Fantastique was at least the dramatic equal of most operas being performed in that decade, and certainly had the equal potential for feats of amazing virtuosity, almost being a concerto for orchestra, stirring vigorous debate and discussion by the intelligentsia, 
and sheer utter outrage and scandal. Speaking of which, let's get back to Berlioz's scandalous movement with a quick review of the instrumentation here at the start of this first lecture out of five. As I mentioned in the original overview, the opening page has a sprawling look to it, similar to a work by Mahler or Richard Strauss, or perhaps an epic film score. And while the scoring is epic, Berlioz manages to get a huge sound simply in the way that he maximizes the potential of his resources, rather than calling for quintuple winds or octuple horns. In fact, the winds are just doubled, except for, of course, our bevy of four bassoons. Notice that Piccolo has its own staff, and in fact this movement has a huge part for Piccolo throughout, with no change back to second flute. Then, as I've touched on in previous lectures, we see the little pea shooter E-flat clarinet finally make an appearance, with the lighter sounding C clarinet still played by the first clarinetist, probably as much for having a warmed up instrument in the player's hand from the fourth movement as for its shriller timbre. The brass are pretty well chosen for their ability to hit certain pitches in the keys of C major and C minor plus the latter's relative major of E-flat when it comes around. So horns in E-flat and C, E-flat trumpets, and B-flat cornets are all perfect for the job. One alto and two tenor trombones. Strangely enough, the alto is in tenor clef, and the tenors are in bass clef. And then ophoclides at the bottom, usually played by tubas today which Berlioz would probably support most willingly, as he had very mixed feelings about the ophoclide, and even less respect for the serpent, which in the first draft covered the upper ophoclide part. As I just said, this is all in the overview, so go have a look there for more details. Then for percussion, he assigns two timpanists, each covering a different pair of kettles. Now, recall that Berlioz envisioned different stations of timpani at opposite sides of the stage, which could add to a sense of space as we heard in the distant thunder of the third movement, or an exaggerated march in the fourth movement. Here, he's planning some of the harmonic intervals shared between kettles to be clearer rather than murky, if they're coming from two different directions. I'm not so sold on this myself, having heard different recordings and performances where the timpani are set up like this. The combination of two pitches and thirds tends to lessen their harmonic value fourths, fifths, and octaves, with perhaps the occasional sixth, all play a lot clearer, though really, a single well-defined stroke on one kettle rings the clearest. Then cymbal, in this case a single fortissimo stroke on the final note of the movement with soft beater, Berlioz's spongy baguette. For the bass drum, Berlioz has supplied a footnote that he wants the surface to be placed in an upright position like a kettle drum, and played with the third and fourth timpanists left over from previous movements, also with spongy beaters. On some of the rolls, this produces a truly ferocious effect. Then he wants offstage bells. Once again, I covered the choices made by different orchestras in the very first lecture of this series, everything from purpose-built ship's bells all the way to strange wire frames. But the orchestra that so generously donated their recording to these lectures, the Franz Liszt School of Music Orchestra at Weimar, they go the route of unison pairs of tubular bells. Berlioz adds a note that if one can't find bells that go low enough to supply the bottom note of the triple octave, that it should be supplied by several pianos positioned on the proscenium. But most orchestras don't go to that extreme and simply either use tubular bells or rent or own Berlioz bells for the occasion. And that takes us to the strings, with violins and violas so heavily divided up in twos and threes that it takes up nearly half the page. They won't stay that way for long, but Berlioz is merely being kind to his players and copyists in supplying separate staves for each group of divisi players. Notice the very modern, for that time, indication of mutes 
plus playing Punta d'Arco with the very tip of the bow, this results in a very delicate effect that seems to float imperceptibly into the listener's perception. As we've seen in previous movement, measured tremolo at the very limit of possibility, that probably doesn't matter a whole lot if it slips into being unmeasured, but worth the effort all the same. Quadruple beams at the opening larghetto tempo. The harmony is a very simply scored diminished chord, eventually joined by the lower strings shoving upward with these little octatonic-like fragments, an alternating pattern of half-steps and whole-steps, which, while it sounds spooky, is really just a very sensible way to get around within the harmonic structure of a diminished chord. But, as we'll see in the third bar, the implication of octatonicity is just an illusion because these are simply pitches of the B harmonic minor scale used in a clever way, starting on A sharp, <laughs> rather than on B. These little pushes from lower strings are punctuated at the top by our timpanists hitting soft C sharp thirds, an almost pizzicato sound. I think at this point it's useful to hear what Berlioz was attempting to convey here in his program notes. He wrote, The artist sees himself at a witch's sabbath, in the midst of a hideous gathering of shades, sorcerers, and monsters of every kind, who have come together for his funeral. Strange sounds, groans, outbursts of laughter, distant shouts which seem to be answered by more shouts. That's the direct meaning of the musical imagery here. Let's keep all that in mind as we listen for that laughter and those distant shouts. Here we see a very groaning C-sharp diminished chord. Notice the voicing, with Berlioz strategically leaving out certain pitches rather than filling in every possible tone going all the way up to the top G on first oboe. These apparent gaps in the harmony actually help create a kind of spooky luminosity to the chord, rather than being over-reedy or possibly clumsy, were at one solid, filled-in harmony. The strings swirl over the top of this in little bursts of contrary motion, then dance their diminished harmony down chromatically in pairs of staccatissimo notes. In case you're new to some aspects of notation, that double articulation over a measured tremolo simply means that each note in the pair of notes gets the same staccatissimo attack. You'll see this commonly with double staccato and sometimes even triple or quadruple staccato marks in some scores. Interestingly, the daring harmony is headed straight for this simple C major chord at the start of the next bar, followed by upward plucking pizzicato. That's all very fun, but for me the most interesting part is supplied by these flowing alternating chords in basses and cellos. That has a kind of surging, throbbing effect from below that reminds me of sitting on a big concert subwoofer. There's an elegant crudeness to this approach, as the close harmonies played so low result in strange clashes of overtones above, which is why orchestration manuals usually advise against it, but it works perfectly in Berlioz's hallucinatory hellscape. I love the abrupt but nonetheless effective trade-off right on the downbeat, where the tail end of the pizzicato string statement just serves as the starting point for marching brass and lower winds, practically barking out their staccato chords. Berlioz emphasizes the separation with staccato 16th notes followed by 16th rests for an incredibly crisp punch. This is particularly effective with the C clarinet's lighter shalomo register blending in quite nicely with the brass, even starting off doubling Ophiclide for the first two notes. And, of course, the A2 bassoon lines, remember, once again, do not ever use the word unison when you mean A2 or A3, etc. in a concert, woodwind, or brass part. The A2 bassoon lines work beautifully with the trombones, thickening up the alto line above and slotting right in under the tenors from below. The natural horns in E-flat and C simply play their key notes on written octaves, resulting in a stack of C minor thirds. All of these calculations fit together in the most natural way. <laughs> 
the strings come back in at the start of the next bar and really slam that diminished chord, played over very low voicings along with the low brass and bassoons, which hang on as the strings drop out. Notice the emphasis on F sharp, which results from doubling first and second bassoons with the upper tenor trombone. Berlioz wants to emphasize that diminished fifth between the Ophiclides low C and the upper winds high C. The combined pitch of C in those instruments' upper registers has a very piping quality, with flute and first oboe below and piccolo above. The little pitch bend at the end is once again a first ever breakthrough by Berlioz, something that flutes and oboes could easily do, but had never before been asked to in a symphony. Of course, they can't pitch bend down a full octave like Berlioz asks, but they can fake it quite nicely. This is immediately echoed by muted solo third horn playing the same line two octaves lower. Remember that C horn parts sound down a full octave, which is intentionally barely audible. The only accompaniment here is a triple pianissimo roll by our two bass drum players. Berlioz has to somehow get from this low echo all the way back up to a restatement of the opening material with high wispy string tremolos. And he does this with a big upward reaching figure that starts in cellos and oboes, moves through the violas and second violins doubled by C clarinet and first oboe, and finishes with first violins and divisi seconds plus all the upper winds, especially the piccolo, ending with the top divisi violins on that high A flat. I love the implied character of quartal harmony here, with all those rising fourths following one another, though of course adjusted so as to fit into the diatonic scheme of a C major scale. The next four bars are essentially copy-paste of the first four bars of this movement, except transposed up a minor second from B minor to C minor. But Berlioz still makes one small adjustment, changing the harmonic relationship of the timpani to lower pitches, emphasizing the completion of those little pushes in the lower strings. He wanted to leave the first timpanist with that B to be used later, not to mention the second timpanist closer to the low G that's coming up. He may have felt that doubling the F in the cellos would be pushing the effect too high. But everything else is virtually the same, which helps to set up the surprise of ending in A-flat with a transition to those surging chords in the lower strings. This time, the upper strings react with this urgent triple octave gesture at the end of the bar, and instead of leading to another diminished chord, they land on a very low A-flat chord, with the augmented sixth of F-sharp changing to an F-sharp diminished chord with the shift to A natural in the next bar. Once again, with the low brass, bassoons, and C clarinet holding on under those repeated high Cs in piccolo flute and first oboe. This time, Berlioz leaves that echoing muted third horn in the context of a simple C major chord. Let's jump back to Berlioz's program notes. The beloved melody appears once more, but has now lost its noble and shy character. It is now no more than a vulgar dance tune, trivial and grotesque. It is she who is coming to the Sabbath. And that's certainly what we see in the C clarinet solo part, marked lointain, meaning distant. Berlioz wants you to imagine a demonic Harriet approaching from afar, accompanied by drummers to a skipping, taunting beat. Here, once again, are intervals in the timpani, 
The interval of a perfect fourth is probably the most successful because of the way the overtones line up, while the interval of a major third that follows is more complex and will tend to be far less clear harmonically, which is why, as I mentioned before, Berlioz has divided the harmony between kettles at opposite sides of the stage. The double roll on bass drum notches up the tension with the overall crescendo of the passage, while the jolt of excitement from middle strings halfway through expresses the anticipation of Demon Harriet's welcoming committee at the Black Mass as they see her appear on the horizon. But the real star here is the C clarinet. Some developing composers who perhaps feel intimidated by transposition have left comments from time to time under my videos proposing that it would be better if players just went back to playing C clarinets all the time to make things simpler for score readers. Listening to this solo, you can hear immediately the hugely strong argument against such a suggestion. Where a B-flat or A clarinet would sound beautifully rich and lyrical, the C clarinet comes across as lightweight when exposed across its middle range like this, something of a mockery of the instrument rather than a fully committed example. But of course, that's Berlioz's intention here. He wants to underline Demon Harriet's laughing contempt of the artist with a shrill, callous kind of sound which will get even shriller when the E-flat clarinet takes over after the big tutti. Let's listen to all those passages again along to the score, from the first bar to Harriet's approach from the distance. As you do, consider all the factors that make this breakthrough orchestration, treating the bass drum like an upright kettle drum with two players rolling away on it, intervals in timpani, a highly exposed character solo on C clarinet with extremely spare accompaniment, and then flipping back through these pages, bending pitches in the upper winds to simulate a full portamento octave, hugely divided string groups playing over Punta d'Arco tremolos on diminished chords, and many other audacious touches that had never before been presented in the context of a symphony, all in service of a dramatic presentation that was equal in narrative power to any opera ever staged up to that time. Back to Berlioz's program notes one last time, where he writes about this section, Roar of delight at her arrival. She joins the diabolical orgy. So this blasting tutti would be the roar of delight from the sulfurous minions. And then the following page would be Demon Harriet joining the proceedings with a continuation of her taunting, prancing perversion of the E-Day fix. We'll cover that in a few minutes, but let's jump back to those roaring minions first. This screen represents such a fierce blast of color with so many different little things happening in different bars that the functions may seem hard to grasp at first. But they're simpler than they look for all Berlioz's ingenious architecture. 
The first two bars comprise a massive E-flat octave across all available instruments, except for timpani on a consonant low G and, of course, untuned bass drum. There are a few different ways of looking at a stacked tutti octave like this. First, one could note the role and placement of each section of the orchestra, with upper winds playing the top two pitches, bassoons covering the lower two, and otherwise avoiding the middle pitch of sounding E-flat, which has enough weight on it already, simply from first trumpet and the overtones of the other brass. Speaking of the brass, they cover the lowest three pitches of this quintuple octave, with E-flat horns going nuts playing with bells in the air, another first for Symphony Fantastique. Notice that Berlioz is keeping his ophiclide up, rather than adding another perfectly playable E-flat 2 below. We see the same thing happening in the string basses and cellos, playing E-flats above the written staves, rather than the easily accessible pitches an octave lower. While violas bridge the gap between cellos and violins, and those violins sit on top with a divisi octave across all parts. Notice that the strings, as the weakest instruments, play a furious measured tremolo on sixteenths, which is much more prominent than just playing a single sustained note doubling the winds and brass. And yet such is the passion of this scoring that they're still a bit hard to make out sometimes. Of course, that is only the beginning of how to think about these two bars. You could also study how each pitch in the octave is doubled by each set of instruments, with piccolo solo on top, all the upper winds on the next E-flat down plus upper divisi violins, then lower divisi violins and upper divisi violas, sharing the middle note with first trumpet, as I mentioned before, and finally bassoons, lower strings, and all the rest of the brass sitting on the bottom two pitches. The blending of tone on each pitch would be another thing worth looking at, and then how all the overtones stack up from top to bottom to actually focus a great deal of weight upwards, rather than being too bottom heavy. Looking forwards, you can see how, in nearly every part, the initial E-flat from this tutti serves as a starting note for the music to explode outwards into differentiated functions. Let's break those apart so you can see how the construction may not be as complex as you might think. To understand Berlioz's motives, consider that the monster E-flat octave was originally a surprise note, coming right at the end of the C clarinet solo, right when the audience was expecting a nice little E natural. So Berlioz has to take this surprise E-flat and somehow turn it into the new key center going forward, which we can see by the key signature change at the end of the page. That really explains everything that happens on this entire screen. Without tortuously going through all the harmonic progressions right now, as this lecture is long enough as it is, Berlioz is going to move us through some chord changes over the next nine bars, dropping us off with a jolt on a B-flat chord, the 5 of E-flat. The bones of this harmonic motion are in the E-flat horns, blaring away at their E-flat octaves, written C up a major sixth, remember, then sounding Gs, and finally up to B-flat octaves, ending with a B-flat fifth, written G octaves, and then a G fifth. We see the same written pitches in the E-flat trumpet part, sounding up a minor third, so an octave higher than the horns. The main differences are that the trumpets play quarter note triplets, fast enough in cut time, and go to a unison instead of an octave toward the end, so the first player doesn't end up screaming on a high-sounding B-flat, which, though perfectly playable on an E-flat trumpet, would wipe out the high strings and winds. The A2 cornets are playing exactly the same pitches as second trumpet throughout, right up to the little sounding B-flat third at the end. Let's have a listen to that section, and as we do, try to focus just on the repeated notes in the E-flat horns, trumpets, and cornets, and don't get distracted by all the other parts, which we'll study in a moment. <laughs> The next step in deconstructing this passage is to look at the role played by sea horns and bassoons, with other instruments underlining their parts from time to time. This line serves as a bridge between the E-flat brass and cornets, tying the melodic arc to the harmonic motion. It also fills in many pitches of the bass line while bulking up the brass section. 
In a modern score with chromatic brass, such scoring might look very different, but it's still fascinating to see how consistently full-bodied this passage comes off, and it still sounds great today with valve horns and piston trumpets. What remains, though it looks somewhat complex, not to mention scattershot, is actually fairly simple. If you just draw an intertwining line through the top two first violin divisi staves, you can unlock the puzzle immediately. Everything else is just a reinforcement of this melodic line, whether playing in unison or octaves, or supporting it harmonically. What does Berlioz achieve by breaking up this line into little fragments in the strings? A kind of rippling effect amid the racing momentum, as bits are tossed from one set of players to the other. I wouldn't recommend imitating this if you're still a developing orchestrator. Get some real experience working with live players before you dive into something along these lines. The only holdouts to this little game are the upper winds in the first four bars, hammering away at those E-flat octaves. But soon enough, they join in the chase all the way to the five chord at the end of the screen. Let's play the music again, and this time listen for how all those structural elements lock so easily and cleanly together, despite the swirling chaos that Berlioz is evoking. We just studied the roar of delight. Now let's look at how Demon Harriet joins the diabolical orgy. And after such a huge explosion of sound, the music suddenly scales down to a very small but well-chosen ensemble of instruments. We've heard Berlioz explore a vast spectrum of emotional characters throughout this entire symphony. Now we're going to see him at his brattiest. Harriet is now dancing on Berlioz's grave in the bluntest, most contemptuous way, to a crudely scored E-flat major root triad shared by C clarinet and oboes, over which she mockingly repeats a cruel parody of the E-day fix on E-flat clarinet. This is the first and still perhaps the best known solo appearance of that difficult, often exasperating instrument in the orchestral repertoire. I think it's hilarious how it starts on the blander, more banal throat tones, flirting a little across the lower clarino register, and then moving upward to squeakier notes that then trade off to the even squeakier piccolo, after which the two instruments chirp away tauntingly over the snorting, horse-laughing bassoons. Notice the marking of poco forte for clarinets and oboes. This would mean just a little under forte, but not mezzo forte. In other words, not a supporting or moderated dynamic, as we see in piccolo and bassoons when they join in. If anything, the cruder and more cackling the clarinet solo's energy, the better. But obviously, Berlioz doesn't want the players to overdo it. He knew that the joke was so good that he could just let it ride for a couple dozen bars without any kind of dynamic inflection, just gradually thickening up the texture, fluttering middle strings filling in gaps and strengthening the bassoons, flute firming up the E-flat clarinet line, and then second violins filling out the harmony in the middle winds. By the time we get to figure F, the whole mad dance is rollicking along with the addition of skipping horns, and then first violins jumping into the melody. I love the hypnotic groove that follows, with piccolo, flute, and violins swirling in a harmonized figure in contrary motion to the violas and cellos below, all while the horns and the rest of the winds plug away at this stack of C minor thirds. Now let's listen to this entire section one more time, from Demon Harriet's entrance on E-flat clarinet, all the way to those swirling winds and strings we just looked at. And along the way, watch how Berlioz intensifies the emotion simply by adding one instrument after another, 
and making the functions of each part more direct and emphatic. Then we'll check out just one more screen before the end of this lecture. Just to point out, for the purposes of this lecture, I cut off that last bar halfway so as to keep all the related content on one screen. Now let's look at the answer to those maniacally obsessive circling riffs, as we see on the next screen. Starting with the leftover half bar, a mighty A-flat major chord. So what is Berlioz doing here harmonically? Just as he drove home the idea of a modulation to E-flat with the orchestra going full bore before the E-flat clarinet solo, he's now going to do the same thing, but this time going from E-flat major to C minor. We just saw some C minor bars that were incidental to the unfolding of the music, but not really a firm establishment of the new tonal center. Now, from this blazing A-flat chord, Berlioz follows up with some thrashing G7 chords, the dominant 7 of C minor. But he can't just resolve to the new tonic, because that would be boring, and he has a lot more tone painting to do. We'll save some of those machinations for the next lecture, but first let's see how Berlioz underlines the anticipation, and gets as much tension as he can out of withholding the cadence, keeping us listeners on the edge of our seats with expectation. Let's diagram some of that, starting with the big A-flat chord. As I've mentioned in other videos, big tutti chords of the Romantic era often emphasize the root and the third, with less weight on the fifth, as that pitch is implied, and already very much in evidence because of the overtones, especially in a major chord. But here, Berlioz cannot help but overstate the fifth, because that pitch is both the destination note of those little circular figures that preceded it and also the most essential common tone between the previous chord of C minor going toward this A-flat chord. E-flat will also be the top pitch for the starting, middle, and ending points of the beatdown over the next five bars. So the pitch of E-flat is shared across octave first violins, octave cornets, octave E-flat trumpets, second horn, E-flat clarinet, flute, and piccolo with half a bar at the beginning by violas playing a very easy double-stop E-flat sixth. The rest of the instruments are playing the far more essential pitches of A-flat and C, the tonic and the mediant. A-flat across three octaves in the lower strings. Once again, Berlioz is keeping his basses and cellos up, with the same pitches doubled by Ophiclide, a four bassoons plus second tenor trombone, and alto trombone plus first horn. The only other instrument covering the tonic is second oboe, catching the overtones of the brass below it. As to the mediant of C, that's also well represented from C3 upwards, from octave C horns with first tenor trombone doubling the top note, all the way up to C octave second violins with C clarinet and first oboe thickening up the highest pitch. The timpani rolls on C below as well. When you put all these notes together, you get a very radiant, fierce chord, glowing brass topped by bright winds, with a return of 16th note tremolo strings, crossing the whole soundscape from flute down to ophiclide. And now for the beat down. Notice that for the most part, the pitches that follow the chord we just studied are more or less the same with a few alterations in winds and strings jumping up a little here or there to make the harmony brighter. Also, the lower heavy brass drop out entirely. This is because the trombones and ophiclide would add too much weight, 
Better to save them for the next big tutti punch on those upcoming G chords. The rest of the brass section more or less just punches away at the pitches they were playing in the A-flat chord, except that the horns double up to A2 with each pair. This gives them even more punch, adding some strength so that they can better balance with the trumpets. Berlioz is anticipating Rimsky-Korsakov's advice about balancing horns with heavy brass by about 77 years. First violins, violas, and timpani all join in the same function of repeating their previous notes. To jump back to what I said at the beginning of this lecture about multiple articulations above a measured tremolo, here we see no less than six staccato marks above some of these notes, but notice that Berlioz politely scored out a full bar before, so the players would completely understand the context of that abbreviation. Once you've separated out the repeated notes, then what remains is a very simple C minor third, the top half of an A-flat major chord, chromatically descending down a full octave and then ascending right back up again. Interestingly, while the harmonic emphasis on higher instruments is really on the top note of the third, E-flat and then downward and upward, the much lower bassoons, cellos, and basses are playing the bottom pitch of the minor third, starting from C. This spreading of the harmony is another revolutionary touch by Berlioz, though he bolsters the upper instruments a bit with the harmonizing presence of second oboe and C clarinet, albeit these are nowhere near powerful enough to balance on their own without the stabilizing pitches two to three octaves below. If that little mini passage seemed familiar to you, that's because it's a rewrite of that mysterious bridging section from the first movement, where staccato string chords move up and down chromatically along to octave winds and horns. The echo of that passage just feeds into Berlioz's emotional tone painting and the whipping G chords that follow almost feel like he's punishing himself for his obsessive nature, or at least feeling the after-effects of falling into a vortex of unrequited passion. Whatever the imagery he's trying to convey, it's still some great scoring. First violins, violas, and cellos playing the whipping upward rips in a triple octave, with flute doubling firsts and piccolo adding a fourth octave above. Second violins add some string color to the B-thirds played by the other upper winds. This fills in the pitches of a G major chord above, while the bassoons, brass, timpani, and double basses take the rest of the harmony below. Timpani are back to using wooden mallets with a little covering, as requested in these score notes, and the effect helps the repeated chords to bounce a little. First and second bassoons and alto trombone Supply the F natural required to make this into the dominant 7 of the eventual C minor chord to come. But as I mentioned before, Berlioz isn't going to make it that easy and obvious. After all the previous explosive chords, he's going to underline his ongoing emotional torment with some harmonic misdirection in the form of massive unison octaves first in the entire string section descending in accented, syncopated octaves from that high G. Once again, I want you to imagine the effect on the audience back then to hear the sheer power of a fully stocked string section back in 1830 when this was premiered, when they were used to hearing often quite underpowered strings. Then the whole orchestra joins in the octaves, except for natural trumpets, cornets, and timpani. Flute and piccolo are just there for added tone weight, but they make next to no difference playing in their weak registers against the mighty overtones of the horns and trombones. To be honest, the rest of the winds don't make a whole bit of difference either, but better to add them in than leave them out. Berlioz gives them a tiny bit of a chance by marking the trombones and ophoclide forte to the rest of the orchestra's fortissimo, but there's still not a lot of room in the sound picture. One last little thing to notice is that the horns are essentially playing an A4 unison, 
The pitches of the sea horn are pretty much all available quite easily with a natural instrument, while the written B natural and A on the E flat horns might take a little finagling. Played all together, there would be a nice evenness of tone. And of course, on today's fully chromatic instruments, none of this raises an eyebrow whatsoever. <laughs> Let's listen to this entire screen now, and then I will just leave all of my viewers with thanks for sticking with me over the past year as this series got delayed by quite a few different things that came up. And now somehow, on top of everything else going on as I score the last couple of numbers for a big crossover concert at the end of the year, and work my way through the second half of the Barvinsky Challenge entries, I'm also getting these lectures finished as well. It's turning into a whirlwind of activity, but I'm enjoying it all immensely. Think about the architecture of this screen that I just laid out for you as I play back the live recording of that phenomenal orchestra of the Franz Liszt School of Music at Weimar, and I'll see you very soon for the next lecture on Dream of a Sabbath Night, the finale of Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique.